Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to be discussing with you the traffic across the plasma membrane. That's right, there's lots of movement between the extracellular fluid and the inside of the cell. And just to review a little bit, this particular topic is about bulk transport, about very large molecules that, that struggle a little bit to get in and out of the plasma membrane because they're very large. And so, in order to establish the fact that large molecules have difficult time, let's talk a little bit about um, small things. And so, a little bit of a review, perhaps, if you're familiar with the movement of molecules across a cell. So, take a look here. Like small molecules, especially small, sort of lipid soluble ones, move very easily across the cell membrane, across the phospholipid bilayer, I should say, specifically. You know, things that are even small and polar, like water, can sort of scoot across the plasma membrane as well. You know, obviously, or maybe not obviously, gases such as oxygen, very small and nonpolar, can move across, carbon dioxide move across. Now, a reason, the reason why molecules move in the first place is because they're, they're in motion. And number two is because of diffusion, the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to low concentration. But when you talk about like small molecules such as ions, like sodium, potassium, chlorine, even though they're tiny, they're electrically charged, and the plasma membrane is resistant or non-permeable to those things. And so you're like, well, wait a minute, how can these things get across? How can things like that are non-lipid soluble, such as polar molecules like glucose, amino acids, and ions, well, you might recall those require specific membrane channels that provide this hydrophilic passage in and out of the cell. And so those are known as either ion channels or just basically facilitated diffusion. Okay, So that's how small molecules move in and out of the cell. But if you want to talk about large things, we're going to be discussing in this video exo, which means to exit, and endocytosis, which is the cell. And so here's a picture of an amoeba, single-celled protist, which is reaching out with its membrane. Now, the thing about a membrane is that it is fluid, and so it can do this. And sort of it reaches out with its false feet, in other words. This, this was called, back in the day, although it's still called pseudopodia. In other words, false feet right here. Now, it looks to be engulfing something, and it, it appears to me some kind of algal cell. So another, in other words, some kind of protist as well. But it's very large. That's the point. Large molecules. And so let me sort of emphasize this. Like this large molecule, this is not going to diffuse across the plasma membrane. This is also not going to diffuse across membrane-bound organelles. What needs to happen is that when this membrane stretches out and this membrane stretches out, these things fuse together and form a vesicle. And then this vesicle enters into the cell. So it's pretty cool. That, I mean, this is what we would call endocytosis, like coming in. But the cell also creates vessels for export to leave the cell. And so it's this is what we mean by two-way traffic or what I mean by that. And so, um, okay, so in our blood, we have these white blood cells and we have red blood cells and we have some platelets. In the plasma, the fluid of the, of the, of the tissue, you can have bacteria in there. Of course, they're unwanted, but these little, these little bacteria can get in here like this. And so what can happen, if I can animate this, is that the, the white blood cell can actually reach out with its membrane like we just saw with the amoeba. It can reach out with its membrane like this and literally engulf through endocytosis, a very large bacterium. Now, it's, it's not going to be the case that the bacteria is just going to sit there and allow the cell to release hydrolytic enzymes to digest it so that it can diffuse across the plasma membrane. It needs to actively move out and like grab these guys. And so that's what's happening. And it's, of course, the bacteria doesn't like that. And so it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> unhappy with this. This is a beautiful picture scanning electron micrograph of a white blood cell which is reaching out and grabbing this these two bacteria. Now these are circular bacteria, some kind of coccus, coccus bacteria. Maybe it's streptococcus or staphylococcus. And this is the white blood cell reaching out 
with its membrane engulfing a pretty awesome picture. Okay, and this is what happens when the white blood cell, it's like, oh, dear. <laughs> and so what we're dealing with here is that large molecules, okay, large molecules shown here in, in blue. What could they be? Examples of a large molecule is a polysaccharide. Now, any kind of polymer, especially polar, like a, like a big protein, that's not going to diffuse across the plasma membrane. It is not. It is not. So therefore, it must be engulfed in this case. In other words, the cell reaches out and it grabs these things, and then it's enclosed in a vesicle. So that's important. And then again, like the reverse of that, cells are in the business sometimes of secreting things. Like, for example, a cell that is specialized for secreting called a gland, or many cells form the gland, those cells will secrete large molecules. Like, for example, they'll secrete protein, so secretory cells. They'll secrete a protein by forming a vesicle, and then that fuses with the plasma membrane, and then the contents are exported. That's really important. That's exocytosis. And so lots of our cells of our digestive system, the epithelial cells that line our digestive tract, they'll secrete hydrolytic enzymes this way, because these are big proteins, to the outside. And so this is how cells secrete large molecules. They secrete through forming little vesicles to the outside, and this is how molecules take it in. So if you take a look at this, check this out. Um, here's the plasma membrane. And so something big that's, that the cell wants, like that maybe that's a bacteria, or maybe this is some sort of large uh, protein, basically what it'll do is it'll hit the plasma membrane, and then the cell membrane sort of engulfs it. And then it comes in in the form of a vesicle. So that's endocytosis. And then likewise, the cell right here, what you're looking at is the an animation of the Golgi apparatus. Now, this is inside of this thing. I can animate it inside of this is all, all of our little proteins in here, which are too big. And then this is a phospholipid bilayer. So this vesicle, which is leaving the Golgi apparatus, is destined to leave the cell through the process of exocytosis. And so this is what's going to happen. The cell's going to secrete that. And then that fuses with the plasma membrane like that. And then the contents are released to the outside. And so if you're following this, it's kind of like endo and exocytosis are um, opposites of one another. Now, now of course, this is a, a simplistic look at it. There's more detail to it. But I, I find that this is pretty interesting. Like. So here is a picture of the real Golgi apparatus. We just saw that in the animation. And so these circles right here, trying to animate that, these are those transport vesicles. And those transport vesicles have large molecules inside. Let's just say that they're protein. And that vesicle then needs to fuse with the plasma membrane. Here are the proteins inside. And when it fuses with the plasma membrane, it actually will allow those large things to exit. And so there you go, right there. So when the two membranes come in contact, the bilayers of each, the plasma membrane and the vesicle bilayer, fuse. And then it sort of like, you know, releases or spills the contents to the outside. Pretty neat. And that's called exo because you're exiting to the out, the outside, you're exiting. Exo the cell, exo the cell. So it's a means of transport and moving things from the outside. Now, it says here that the cytoskeleton is involved in this, and that's true. I'm not getting into that detail, of that, although that's pretty awesome also. The cytoskeleton is directing, so it's sort of like a monorail. The, cyto, the cytoskeleton will direct those transport vesicles to the outside. It's pretty cool. There's some motor proteins involved in that as well. So when something is coming into the cell, we refer to it as endo. So coming in, endocytosis. So what is that? I can tell you what it's not. I'll tell you it's not an ion. I'll tell you it's not an amino acid or glucose. It's like these things are large, okay? So they cannot go through the phospholipid bilayer and they cannot come in through facilitated diffusion. They must be engulfed. And so when they are engulfed by the cell, they form vesicles. Now, that doesn't mean that this thing has to remain large. Again, you might recall this from a pre previous video or in your background in biology. 
This vesicle that comes in like this sometimes depends on the organism is referred to as a food vacuole. That will then fuse with an organelle inside the cell known as the lysosome. I'll just write it out, lysosome. And that's a digestive organ, uh, organelle. And so those have proteins of themselves in there that are hydrolytic that will eventually digest the content of this. Because if you're taking in something large, like if this is a white blood cell and this is bacteria, you can't just take something in. It ultimately needs to be digested. Okay? And so, again, when you take in something from the outside that's really large, like this, like endocytosis, there's a small area of the plasma membrane that, um, that forms this like pocket. So it invaginates right here. It forms this crease right here. And then these... Uh, phospholipids of the plasma membrane will fuse together and then you have like this vesicle that comes in. And so um, sort of the reverse of exocytosis. And so when a cell is taking in something large, something from the outside, again, an older word called phagocytosis, but it's sometimes still used and so it's, it's useful. So phago, a Greek word meaning to eat, so it's cellular eating. So that kind of cool. And so when the cell extends its plasma membrane like that, it was first referred to as pseudo, again, an older term, but kind of cool, pseudo meaning false podium, podia, meaning like false feet. And so do you see here it shows, this is a diagram, this is a transmission electron micrograph of the pseudopodia of an amoeba that's in this case trying to engulf this bacteria right here now. You're like, whoa, whoa, it's eating something that's the same size. You're not seeing the rest of the amoeba, which is like maybe like that. And so it's really stretching this part out. I'll extend it. It's stretching out its, its membrane and it's trying to take in something really large like a bacteria. So it's eating, okay? So once it gets inside, I was referring to this a second ago, once it's inside, it's then gonna fuse with the lysosome. That's what this is. And then this food will then ultimately be broken down. The cell can, can use the content. So uh, endocytosis, taking stuff in, can be categorized in three um, classic types. One would be phagocytosis, which I referred to a moment ago, which is cellular eating. Okay, And that's generally used, like it sort of looks like a jelly bean here, but a large solid particle. Peno, again, a Greek term, slightly older term, but nevertheless useful. Pinocytosis is also a large molecule, but it's generally referred to as a, as a fluid because it translates into cellular drinking. I'm not necessarily a fan of that particular term because a beginning student sometimes will think that cells are drinking, like, like drinking water, but water obviously doesn't come in this way because water just simply diffuses across the cell membrane or it actually travels through facilitated diffusion via water proteins called aquaporons. But nevertheless, large liquid coming in, large solid coming in, and then this one's really cool, I'll, I'll mention it in a moment. It's called receptor mediated. Okay, so there's actually protein receptors that can assist the movement of large molecules into the cell. Now this is obviously more specific so receptor-mediated endocytosis is that the cell is intentionally trying to grab a particular, like in this case, a star, and bring in that in, but it's ignoring other molecules. So that's pretty interesting how the cell can regulate the movement in and out of the cell in this fashion. So in pinocytosis, again, you're taking in molecules, in this case, um, the green molecule and the uh, purple triangle. So it's it's less specific or non-specific, non-specific. So it's taking in things that are coming in in this matter. These molecules are sometimes called ligands, if you've heard that term before. So it's non-specific ligand movement of liquid across the plasma membrane. Here's an actual photograph of these um, molecules. You can't see the ligands themselves, these molecules, but they're coming in. Look at that, coming in. So this is pinocytosis, pretty cool. Now. Receptor mediated, very, very, very specific. So that's the important word. And so the process is triggered when the, the, this extracellular substances, in, in other words, like in this case, the purple triangle is going to be the specific thing that's coming in, which is called the ligand. Okay, so it's 
these things on the outside, these ligands will bind to recept specialized receptors. And what's interesting is these things can actually move laterally in the plasma membrane. And so these receptors all kind of congregate in this invagination, which then causes the, the outer membrane to pinch in. And therefore you take in more of the uh, purple triangle than, than of the green. Then there it is right there showing uh, receptor, which is what this is, receptor mediated, meaning it's helping a mediator endocytosis and it's very specific so pretty cool now an example of that I think I think it's useful is in our blood we have things called lipoproteins and so lipoproteins can be char characterized by their density now what is a lipoprotein it's it's these vesicles that carry various lipids in the bloodstream because lipids are nonpolar so they can carry things like cholesterol phospholipids, triglycerides. And the one of interest to, to, to medicine mostly is low density lipoproteins because these carry cholesterol. And cholesterol gets a bad rap, but maybe rightly so. You don't really want a lot of low density lipoproteins and they're called low density lipoproteins because of the ratio of protein to lipid. So they're, they're, they're of low density. So LDL for short. So these things are cruising in the blood, okay? So we have this cruising in the blood. And it's like, so if it's in the blood, how does a cell take in a low density lipoprotein? So this thing's kind of large. And so lipoproteins bind to the LDL receptors. And so let me see if I can make the attempt of drawing this. Okay, so here's the blood right here. And let's go, here's a cell right here. Here's another cell like this. Here's another cell. Now these low density lipoproteins, let's go uh, yellow with them. So these low density lipoproteins are cruising around here and they carry cholesterol. Low density lipoprotein, LDL. You don't want a lot of these. A high level of LDL in the blood could, could, uh, could be detrimental to your health. And so what's interesting is that cells have these low density lipoprotein receptors. Now, if you have a lot of them, you're going to be able to take in a lot more. And if you don't have any at all, you will ignore the low density lipoproteins. And so these things will attach right here. And then ultimately the cell will engulf them. So that's what I'm trying to get at. And so there's other uh, lipoproteins. There's VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins. There's high density lipoproteins. Uh, HDL. Sometimes this is referred to, and that's why the, the, it's kind of funny, like this is a kind of the devil, meaning um, this is what people refer to as bad, bad cholesterol. Um, the, the fact is cholesterol isn't bad, it's just when you eat, have a lot of it, it's not so good. And so uh, I want to bring up a particular disorder, it's difficult to pronounce, so I apologize. So it's hypercholesterolemia. Uh, and this, this is an inherited disease where your LDL receptors are defective. And if that's the case, you're going to have a lot more LDLs because the cells aren't being able to take them in. So a person who's eating um, cholesterol in their diet, in other words, they're eating meat that has cholesterol, this isn't getting absorbed. And so what's going to happen over this person's lifetime is that plaque will de develop on the outside and that will actually block the flow of blood atherosclerosis. And so that's a narrowing that and you're like, well, that's, I'm not really concerned about it. You should be concerned about that. Because if that narrows your blood vessel, crucial oxygen and nutrients are not being able to pass through this particular area. Now this happens, if this is a coronary or heart vessel, that could actually block the passage of oxygen to, to the muscle and cause a heart attack, or if this is in the brain, can cause a stroke. And so an individual would be who has this would obviously be on cholesterol lowering some uh, medication and then also advised to lower cholesterol in their diet uh, so and take some statins and so to lower it and so you know here's just some general numbers you don't really want to have high numbers of low density lipoproteins because this is associated with atherosclerosis and so basically I, I finished with that example but this particular video again just to summarize was a discussion of large molecules or bulk 
transport across the plasma membrane, both endo inside and exocytosis. And again, if you're coming in, it's either phago, pinno, or cell, cell mediated receptor proteins helping. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion on bulk transport. Thanks for watching.